Brothers and sisters, this Sunday is Christ the King Sunday. It's the final Sunday in the liturgical calendar that marks the end of our calendar year in the church. Christ the King Sunday. Next Sunday we begin Advent. And the gospel for Christ the King Sunday comes to us from the gospel according to St. John, reading from the 18th chapter, beginning with the 33rd verse. Pilate went back into the palace. He summoned Jesus and asked, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others spoken to you about me? Pilate responded, I'm not a Jew, am I? Your nation and its chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, My kingdom doesn't originate from this world. If it did, my guards would fight so that I wouldn't have been arrested by the Jewish leaders. My kingdom isn't from here. So you are a king, Pilate said. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. I was born and came into the world for this reason, to testify to the truth. Whoever accepts the truth listens to my voice. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Early on in my life at university, I had aspirations to do something academic. I knew that academics would be part of my life, and so I was particularly attentive to people who were impressive to me as far as professors were concerned. There were some professors that I wanted to emulate more than others, and one early on was a Reformation history professor. He was himself a fairly recent graduate from his PhD program, but this guy was, for me, impressive. He was impressive for so many reasons. First of all, his hair was never out of place. (laughs) It was always perfect, and he dressed exceptionally well with the latest fashion. He looked good. He had a leather briefcase that seemed never to get scratched or bruised in any way. And the books that he carried, though I was quite sure he'd read them all, they all looked brand new all the time. This guy was an impressive professor and he taught well as well. He was interesting to listen to and seemed to have a pretty good command of the subject. He was, from my point of view, the real thing. He was what I aspired to be. I was very, very young at the time, but I thought this guy was really something else. Well, as the years rolled on, I continued to be impressed by the things that he presented, this particular teacher, and I continued to study a variety of things. And I was made eventually resident assistant and head resident. And so in my final year as head resident, um, we had an event that took place every single year. And on that day, I was busy with preparations. It was called the Luther Lecture. I attended Luther College. And every year, we had a special guest lecturer, which was a part of a series we called the Luther Lecture Series. And this year was exciting to me because my hero, my professor, had said, this guy that's coming, he is absolutely the world's best expert on Reformation history. His name was Roland Bainton. And of course I'd heard of him because we used his text in class and I was looking forward to this. So I was about my business doing my preparations, doing my rounds to make sure that everything was neat and tidy, to make sure that there were no problems anywhere on campus, anywhere around the dormitory or or the college itself. And as I was walking outside, it was a warm spring day as warm as it gets in Canada, at least. And there was, um, okay, I got to tell you, before I say this, I was very young, so forgive me for saying this, but there was an elderly man sitting outside on the bench, and he looked so out of place, because everybody in the college was all very young, with the exception of a few professors. So this, this old, random guy sitting outside looked strange. And what he was doing was even stranger. He had both of his shoes off and was in his stocking feet and was polishing his shoes. He had a brush and some polish and he was polishing his shoes. And I felt compelled because 
he was sort of the, uh, you know, a 1970s vagrant. And I felt compelled to go over there and ask him, I said, can I help you with anything? And before I even got the words out of my mouth, he said, I didn't want to make a mess inside. I said, well, okay, that sounded reasonable. So he went about his business and I left and never gave him a second thought. Well, I continued my rounds, I continued my preparations, and the night came, and we were in the lecture hall, and the main speaker, Roland Baton, was to speak at 8 o'clock. And appropriate, really big deal introductions were made, and all of a sudden, this man comes out on the stage, and it was my shoe polisher. And I remember in that moment of time, thinking how unimpressive he was. He was not at all what I expected him to be. He was wearing a suit that looked like it was a couple sizes too big for him. Not only did it look like it was too big for him, it looked like he took it out of the 1950s, which in those days was already quite old. The only thing he had going for him was that his, his shoes were polished. His hair was tousled. He looked totally disheveled, and I thought, oh, man. I had to sit for two hours through this, and I didn't know what was going to be. Well, after the introductions were made, he came out to the center of the stage. There was no podium, no notes, and he put his feet approximately shoulder width apart, his hands behind his back, and he began to lecture. And what poured forth from his mouth was an absolutely brilliant command of a period of history that has taken centuries for people to wrap their arms around. He knew this period of history better than I could have imagined. And listening to him was like listening to a story unfold. It was like having one's eyes opened about things that happened hundreds of years in the past. It was exceptionally exciting. And as I listened to him, it became clear to me that this was the real thing. This was something to aspire to. My actual professor, he had all the accoutrements and the peripherals that made him appear to be the real thing. But in the final analysis, the one who had it, the one who knew it, the one who professed it, was this teacher I had the privilege of hearing at this time. The real thing. Often in life, we're confronted with questions about what the real thing is. And in fact, this happened in Jesus' life so many times. Towards the end of his life, he was accused by Jewish leaders of presenting himself as king. And for them, this was blasphemy because he said that he was the Messiah and this was for them blasphemy. And so they take him to Pilate, they try to get him condemned because they didn't have the power to condemn him. And in our text today, we hear Pilate questioning him. Are you the king of the Jews? Now, in his ineffably curious way, Jesus says to them, or rather to Pilate, is this something that comes from you, or have you heard others talking about me? Pilate got a little bit upset. He said, am I a Jew? How would I know such a thing? All I know is that your people brought you to me. What have you done? For you see, Pilate, I believe, wasn't convinced that Jesus was a king because Jesus didn't have the accoutrements or the peripherals that made him look like a king. He looked like some itinerant vagrant, just a guy that somebody was picking on. And so he says to him, are you a king? And Jesus says, my kingdom is not from this world. My kingdom does not originate here. My kingdom, if it were originating here, my guards would come and I would never have been arrested in the first place. No, he said, my kingdom doesn't come from here. So Pilate goes on to assert, so you are a king. Jesus' kingship was a curious question and even Pilate didn't want to accept it because he didn't look like a king. He didn't carry himself with grand posture like one would expect a king to do. Jesus didn't look like a king as was expected in those days. So what is the truth? The 38th verse, the verse that is not included in our text, is Pilate asking the question, after Jesus has said, those who listen to my voice will hear the truth, and those who follow my voice will follow the truth. And Pilate says, what is truth? Brothers and sisters, here's what differentiates Jesus as real king 
from those who have the peripherals, those who have all the accoutrements of what a king is. It is truth. It is relationship. Jesus is the real king that commands from us not just verbal assent, not just general agreement, not just fidelity of a political sort. Jesus commands from us, brothers and sisters, as our king, our all, everything that we are, everything that we have, everything that we do comes from him and is to be in his service. Everything, without question. And the reason that Jesus can command this from us is because this is precisely what Jesus has given to us. Everything that he is, everything that he has done has been for us in profound compassion and love. And he calls upon us to be like him in the world, to carry on his mission in the world, to serve him in this world. Jesus, brothers and sisters, is our king. That's what we celebrate on this day, this Christ the King Sunday, the last Sunday in the church here, the recognition that through everything that we've gone through in the last year, we recognize finally that Jesus is our King, and to him we owe fidelity. To him we owe everything that we are. To him we owe service to God's people in the world. Jesus is our King. He wants us to reach out in service to all of his people. Because in Jesus' kingdom, this kingdom of which we are a part, there are people who do not yet know the king. There are people who do not yet know the king and people who do not yet know the comfort that comes from knowing the king. And it is our task to share that. I, together with Joan and Claire and Nancy, had the privilege of coming back to a trip from Cameroon in West Central Africa. And I have to tell you, the lives that the children live there, the lives that the children that we had the privilege of meeting live there is very difficult. They know nothing but neglect and abuse. They know nothing but hurt and pain. They know nothing of the privilege and blessing that we have, and they certainly know nothing except what they've been able to glean from the sisters with whom they're working. They know nothing of what it is that God has done for them because for them God seems so very far because their life is fraught with nothing but pain and torture, literal torture. But Jesus calls upon us to serve them, to offer to them some good news, some hope, in fact, the community that the Jesuits are running there is called Foy de l'Esperance, the, the household of hope, where these children can learn that there's something more than this. And we have an opportunity to share in this, not only in this ministry, but in so many others, to share God's hope in the world. Jesus is our King, brothers and sisters, and calls upon us to share that hope with a world that knows no hope that feels despair and hopelessness. And that feeling is more pervasive than you can possibly know. It is easy for us to remain comfortable inside the confines of these walls where everybody's in general agreement, everybody's more or less friendly with one another, everybody's pretty comfortable generally in life. But Jesus calls upon us to go outside of this place, not to look inwardly, but outwardly, to reach out with the good news that God loves the world. And our king has a kingship that is marked by love and compassion. Now that doesn't seem like such a big deal, but with all of the people in the world that are pushing their accoutrements and their peripherals of what their kingship is, love and compassion is missing. And we need to share that. So brothers and sisters, as you go out from this place today, remember who your king is. Remember the one to whom you owe loyalty and begin to serve in the way that he calls upon you to serve. To share, to love, and to show compassion for the message of love that has been made known to us 
is not known all over the world. It's not even known in the neighborhoods and localities of San Diego. It may not even be known among your circle of friends and family. So brothers and sisters, if you can't do anything else, if you can't utter a word of proclamation because you're too inhibited or too shy, you can do this. Because this qualifies you for membership in Christ's kingdom, and that is love. In the face of everything that's around you, love. When you are with people who might not be agreeable to you, love. When you are with people who seem lost and despairing, love. For in showing love, as Christ has shown us his love, we are members of the kingdom of which he is king. Celebrate Christ's kingdom by showing love. For he is the real thing. Amen. Let us pray. Good and gracious Lord, we give you thanks that you've come to us that you have shown us love in a world that sometimes seems not to have very much love. That you have shown us compassion in a world that certainly lacks it. Help us to spread the good news. To share the good news, if not verbally, then in how we live and how we act. Help us to show that we are members of your kingdom. That you are indeed our king. The real thing. By loving and exercising compassion in all that we do so that the world might know that Jesus is king, the real thing. Amen.